Hi everybody, welcome to, uh, oh, yeah, there's a correction here, hold on. There we go. All right, chapter nine, so uh, Asian Americans, the Cold War part two, the Korean War and aftermath. So um, <clears throat> just as World War II is gonna be a major turning point for the Asian American community, uh, the Korean War will be as well. Um, specifically what it's going to do, uh, and we'll get to the war here in just a minute, but uh, it's going to dramatically increase the connectedness between uh, Korea, in this case primarily South Korea, and the United States. So this is going to be a major turning point. Now, as you guys know already, there was already a Korean population inside the United States, in Hawaii, in California, but the Korean American population was quite small. Most Asian populations were quite small prior to World War II. Uh, but the Korean one, again, was quite small. But the Korean War is going to mark a beginning of a major shift and a significant, uh, over the decades, a significant influx of Korean immigrants, especially uh, starting after 1964. There'll be a much larger increase. But that the Korean War, though, is the genesis of that connectedness between the United States, a long-term ongoing relationship as an ally between South Korea and the United States. And that will continue to increase the uh, Korean uh, population arriving here in the United States and becoming part of the American, uh, uh, Asian American experience. So, all right, so let's go ahead and jump uh, right in. So with uh, the Korean War, which is of course the context for all this. So, and as we've been doing the whole semester, as you guys are aware, um, it's important to understand the context in Asia, to understand the Asian American experience. Um, and we'll be doing that, as you guys know, the whole semester, talking about what's going on in Asia and then moving that to the United States. In this lecture, we pr focus primarily on what happened in the Korean War, but that's, again, critical to understand the Korean community's uh, perceptions of, uh, of their origin, uh, what's going on back home, their deep involvement back home, and again, the increasing number of Koreans being integrated into the United States. So, okay. So, uh, and you guys remember, if you die your memory back, way back to early in the semester, um, Korea had been colonized by the Japanese uh, not long after the turn of the century. So by 1910, the Korean Peninsula is under direct Japanese colonization. Uh, and the Japan will colonize Korea all the way up until the end of World War II, in which the United States will, and the Soviet Union or Russia, will place Japan as temporary power brokers on the Korean Peninsula. And that's what we're coming up to right here. So the map you guys are looking at is the Japanese Empire uh, during World War II. And of course, you see the Korean Peninsula right here. So the importance of that is what comes next and what's going to happen to Korea based on uh, Japanese colonization. And then, of course, the end of World War II, which we're coming to. So, so uh, late in World War II, uh, the U.S. And, and Russia looking at what's going to happen in Asia. Again, let's go back to the map just for a second. How are we going to uh, deal with the sudden power vacuum of the Japanese military being expelled from these regions in Asia? How are we going to help those those nations, those colonized peoples, to transition from uh, Japanese colonial control into some form of independence? Uh, now, on the surface, it seemed like simply the Japanese soldiers would leave, return to Japan, because now the war is over, and these nations could just uh, resume functioning. But it is more complicated than that, because oftentimes there is no local government uh, infrastructure to do that. And so the United States thought at least for a time, and the Russians thought this too, at least for a time, there's going to need to be some stability provided by outside power to give these nations uh, the time and the ability to assume control of their own affairs. Now, by the way, honestly, the U.S. and Russia could have stayed out of it and just let the Koreans just kind of go for it. The Japanese military and control forces of colonization um, imperialization could simply have left Korea and the Koreans uh, perhaps could have sorted things out on their own. Um, 
And that's kind of interesting to think how that would have played out. Now, maybe that would have played out better. I do think there would have been some chaos and conflict in Korea as the Koreans themselves began to navigate what does it look like for us to be uh, independent. I don't doubt there would have been some conflict in Korea. Um, but based on hindsight and what did happen, I don't know. Maybe that would have been better. But that's not how the United States view. The United States view of there's going to be a chaos and the Russians felt that way too. And so at least temporarily, no. The opera word is temporarily. Temporarily, you're going to need to have some occupying force to provide law and order and give the Koreans a chance to get their own nationhood up and running. And then we'll transition, we'll leave. And uh, in this case, the Koreans can make their own self-determination of what they want their new independent nation to be. That was the idea and the theory. But tragically, as you guys probably are well aware, that's not what actually happened. Now, the initial plan was... In the Korean Peninsula would just be temporarily divided between a U.S. sector, which here is in South Korea, and North Korea, which would be temporarily occupied by the Soviet Union or Russia. That was the plan. The plan was that they would not be there probably for more than a year or so. They would simply help the Japanese soldiers who were leaving the Korean Peninsula to be moved to Japan, give the Koreans a chance to talk, kind of take a deep breath, figure out what they want to do. And at some point in the not too distant future, the Koreans would have a national election in which they could elect their new government as they saw fit democratically. The United States and, the, and Russia would then leave at that point and the Koreans could then uh, be independent. And just like any other independent free nation, they could navigate in the future as they wish. That was the plan. But of course, the Cold War and the context of that is going to play havoc with that naive dream of how Korea would be able to simply uh, transition and become independent navigator because that's not what happens. Because both in North Korea, which the Russians control, and in South Korea, which the United States controlled, uh, both sides, of course, naturally, not surprisingly, decide that they want their ideological uh, thought system to prevail in Korea. In this case, United States does not want an election that would elect a unified Korean Communist Party that controls all of Korea. So in the southern portion of Korea, today we think about South Korea, the U.S. is not allowed it to happen. Same thing in North Korea. The Russians are not going to allow a free election that would elect uh, any kind of capitalistic democratic system um, that's free and independent of Moscow's control. They're going to want to have some kind of communist social system takes over North Korea. So the idea of this joint free election where both North and South Korea as one all vote together on the government of their own choosing, their own self-determination. Tragically, that's not what happens. Instead, uh, the United States and Russia determine that their side has to win. And again, in the context of the, of the Cold War and the emerging tensions, uh, both sides are not going to allow that free election to take place. Both sides strengthen the ideological uh, allies of their choice and look to margin, marginalize or sometimes eliminate uh, ideological enemies. So, for example, South Korea, of course, that means the South Korean government is aggressively looking for communists. Some of them are rounded up, some are arrested, thrown in prison, sometimes even some are executed. Same thing in North Korea, the reverse is taking place. And so the idea of this joint election tragically does not take place. Now, both in North Korea and South Korea, you have some North Koreans who are, who are already communists. They're happy to have the Russians there, at least temporarily, because, again, the Russians are backing their ideology, in this case, a communist system. And the one I want you guys to know is that gentleman there on the right, that is a very young Kim Il-sung in 1946. He's going to be the most important North Korean communist and eventually will uh, emerge as a leader of the North Korean Communist Party and the North Korean Communist State under Russian protection and help and tutelage. In South Korea, we'll get to that here in a minute, too. All right. So... Uh, just to give you guys a minute to write this down. So Korea is, again, the idea is we divide it on a 38th parallel, but, parallel, but again, that would, the plan was that would be just simply temporary. Whoops, that's not what I meant to do. There we go. That's what I meant to do. <laughs> okay. Uh, Korea is simply be temporarily divided. That was the goal. Just temporarily. It's not going to be long term. Give you a minute to highlight that. There we go. Okay. Um, and that they'll have this election. They can chart their own national course. Of course, I just mentioned that does not happen. 
So sadly for Koreans, uh, both North and South, that idea of a temporary partition is going to merge, as you guys know well, into tragically a very long term. And that's right now, ongoing partition between North and South. Ideological guerrilla warfare breaks out in South Korea following the end of uh, World War II. Now the Japanese are leaving, um, but in South Korea you have uh, some pro-American, pro-capitalistic, pro-democratic South Koreans. Um, you also have some South Koreans that are hoping for some kind of communist or socialist future. And because of that, you get some quite intense ideological guerrilla warfare in South Korea between of leftist, communist, socialist, South Koreans, sometimes supported by North Korea, and the local authorities who tend to be quite strongly anti-communist. And that fighting get, grows quite intense and tragically. In fact, that actually affected my own family. Uh, my wife, um, both her uncle, so my, my mother-in-law's older brother, who was a school teacher on Jeju Island this time period, uh, he disappeared in this time period. When they disappeared, we think he was probably uh, being a school teacher. Perhaps he had left his sympathies and was arrested by the South Korean police and disappeared. So clearly at some point, one way or another, uh, he would have died in police custody and he'd not be alone in that. Um, my wife's grandparents on her mother's side also were killed in the fighting on Jeju Island. Uh, during this very intense guerrilla ideological warfare taking place in South Korea. Actually, that's prior to the Korean War. Now, it's going to be about what the Korean War is all about, but that intense fighting in South Korea on the local level was actually prior to the start of the official Korean War. So Korea already was on a certain level of tension and outright violence, even prior to the official outbreak of the war, depending on where in South Korea you would be. You have quite intense ideological warfare between some South Korean communists, oftentimes in guerrillas, and then the South Korean military or police forces that's battling them, looking to crush them. In North Korea, you have versions of this as well, whereas the North Koreans, which uh, in this case under Kim Il-sung, it's a communist system, they're looking to eliminate any opposition to the communist takeover of North Korea. So if you were a North Korean and for whatever reason you did not want communism, you better flee to the South and you better do that right now because uh, it's not going to be safe for you either. So both North Korea and South Korea go through quite intense uh, ideological conflict, separation, violence, executions, even massacres, both North Korea and South Korea that's taken place prior to the war. It's going to get worse during the war, but actually prior to the official start of the Cold, uh, I'm sorry, the Korean War. Now, meanwhile, uh, Kim Il-sung is looking to bring all of Korea under his power, and that, in this case, as a unified communist state. So he gets a uh, green light from both uh, Joshua Stalin, of Russia and Mao Zedong of China, both of which, of course, are communist nations, as you guys know, they give the green light and ask, ask them to support a North Korean communist invasion of South Korea. Both Stalin and Mao give Kim Il-sung the green light to invade South Korea, and he would do that. There's an early photograph, and that is a very young Kim Il-sung there, right in the middle. Of course, that's Stalin there behind him and a young Mao Zedong behind him as well. That's a, a wonderful image of North Koreans uh, backing in this Cold War context of the two largest, most powerful communist nations backing North Korea. Now, South Korea on this side has a close and strong ally in the United States. That's General MacArthur doing a bro hug with the first South Korean president, uh, Lee Sung Min. And that's the two of them right there. That's Lee Sung Min there on the right. And that leads to the outbreak of fighting on June 25, 1950, where North Korea, to the shock and surprise of South Korea, launches a rapid, massive invasion of South Korea. South Korea, frankly, is not prepared for this invasion. And the North Korean invasion in the early days very rapidly rolls over much, actually most, of South Korea. The North Korean army is well trained, well supplied with recent modern Russian equipment. For example, that T-34 tank right here rumbling in the streets of Seoul. Um, and these North Korean forces, again, well-trained, well-equipped, often with Russian advisors, very quickly and successfully charged deeply into South Korea, rapidly taking over much of the Korean peninsula. 
so much so that when within a relatively short period of time, nearly the entire Korean Peninsula is under North Korean uh, communist control. Let me show you a map of that. So here on the left, you can see the map right here. You can see these arrows coming down as they're coming down into South Korea. The only part of South Korea that is not yet under uh, North Korean control is a small little, pen well, a small little section of the Korean Peninsula called the Pusan Perimeter, or another map would be, would be to look right here. Now, uh, there's more to this story. I'm just giving you the highlights of the Korean War. Uh, fortunately for South Korea and the United States, uh, in this case, with President Truman saw this as a Russian dangerous exploit uh, expansion, uh, even though this is led by North Korea, of course, but in the in Truman's eyes, in the eyes of many Americans, this is a proxy war of dangerous communist expansion in Asia, and the United States must meet this threat. Even though, of course, Korea is very far from the United States, but the idea that communism is on the march and triumphing, and we have to confront that. And South Korea was our ally. The U.S. military in South Korea was quite small at that time and not well prepared for this invasion, nor well armed. So the U.S. military in those early days was not able to do much at all to stop the North Korean, North Korea's rapid advance into South Korea. But Truman, the U.S., uh, decided to directly intervene and do so quickly. They also go to the U.N. and get a U.N. mandate for the U.N. to also to come to assistance of South Korea. One of the few times, by the way, in world history where the U.N. is given a mandate uh, for the uh, UN nations to participate in armed conflict to defend a member nation. So, uh, again, we're not going to do the play by play of the whole Korean War. Uh, I do like military history, and I would like that. <laughs> uh, and also, as you guys know, I have a strong tie to South Korea, so I would like that. But uh, for the context of our class, though, we're not going to get into a deep dive into the Korean War. Uh, I just want to hit a few highlights to give you an idea of uh, the context of how this is going to impact Korea, America, and then ultimately into the immigration of Koreans and their background into the United States. So, uh, General MacArthur, who's charged by the United States government to find a way to save South Korea, comes up with a very ambitious plan. It's, uh, I wouldn't call it reckless, but it's risky. It's innovative, it's smart, but it's also very risky, which is instead of simply pouring soldiers into that very small foothold on the South Korean Peninsula to do something completely unexpected by North Korea, in this case, to have a, a large U.S.-led invasion fleet to surprise in North Korea land right here at a place called Incheon, to land there and drive across the peninsula, surprise North Korean soldiers, most, of course, who are going to be here attacking the Pusan perimeter. North Koreans are not expecting, of course, attack there in Incheon, which was the whole U.S. plan. So, now the risk part of that was um, the tides there in Incheon are very extreme. The, the, the Incheon there, the tides, some, some places are 18 feet. What that means is when the tide's in, it's great. Your landing craft can go all the way to the beaches there in Incheon, and your men could unload. Your Marines and so forth unload. But remember, the tide is 18 feet, right? So when the water goes out... It doesn't go out just a little bit. It goes way, way, way out. And Incheon, is, the harbor there is quite shallow. So when the tide goes out, it leaves miles and miles of, of mud. And so it, what that means is practically if you're the invading army, you can do a first wave, drop off a bunch of U.S. Marines and U.S. soldiers. But then you know the tides come in. So all landing craft have to quickly withdraw back to the ships, which are miles offshore. Uh, because they can't stay, because again, the, the, the tide goes out so far, they have to go miles and miles back out to sea because the tide itself goes so far back. And then you have to wait seven, eight, nine, ten hours for the tide to work its way for you to send reinforcements, more ammunition, or take off wounded. So again, it's quite risky. And so that initial wave, once they get dropped off there, you're on your own for quite a while. But fortunately, um, the North Koreans did not expect this. It was a stroke of genius. Again, risky because it could have gone wrong, but MacArthur backs this, and it works like a charm. North Koreans are caught completely flat-footed. They don't see this attack coming. The U.S. and South Korean uh, invasion fleet arrives there off Incheon. The U.S. Marines are able to storm ashore. You see the picture right there of the U.S. Marines storming ashore there on the left. That's General MacArthur on his flagship watching from the bridge, watching the U.S. Marines going in. And it works very, very well. In fact, so well that the U.S. and South Korean and U.N. forces rapidly begin to 
cut across the peninsula. Many North Korean army units are cut off because, again, they're down here, right? They're getting all the supplies from China and from North Korea. So when the U.S. South Korean forces begin to rapidly move across the peninsula right here, you don't have to be a military genius to realize all these North Korean army units down here are in deep, deep trouble. They begin to try to rapidly retreat north. Most of them won't make there, make it there. And so suddenly this whole war just flips 180 and the, the U.S. South Korean Union forces begin to rapidly move north into North Korea. Uh, within just months, the whole war goes from looking like a, a complete communist North Korean victory to within just a few months later, uh, a complete reversal. Looks like a South Korean U.S. U.N. victory now, and it looks like all of North Korea now will be liberated by the U.S. South Korean U.N. forces, and Korea will be united under a friendly, pro-Western, hopefully democratic nation that's close to the United States, and that'd be the whole Korean Peninsula. Unfortunately, that's not what happens because as a Chinese watch. The collapse of North Korean armies as they rapidly retreat and disintegrate as they flow north. As they see U.S., South Korean, and U.N. soldiers approaching the border of China. Again, we're saying like in this region right here. China decides that's unacceptable. They cannot allow a, a, a unified, pro-Western, pro-capitalistic, pro-democratic uh, Korea united right next to it. And so China decides... They're not going to allow the outcome to happen. And China suddenly enters into the war by pouring hundreds of thousands of fresh Chinese soldiers to help reinforce the retreating North Korean units. And this causes, for the third time, a complete flip in the war. Because suddenly the United States and the South Korean Union forces are caught um, overconfident, overextended by this massive influx of Chinese soldiers. And again, the war begins to flow rapidly south. This is a propaganda poster from China showing, in this case, uh, a North Korean soldier here on the left and a Chinese soldier here on the right, and their version of attacking uh, the United States and our Western allies and the South Koreans. Obviously, these are the bad guys right here. That'd be General MacArthur there. So these, these maps right here, sure, we're talking about. See, see all these red arrows? That's the Chinese forces rapidly pushing south. Uh, against the U.S., South Korean, and U.N. forces. And again, the war seesaws back in the North Korean Chinese favor. A lot of terrible fighting that winter. This would be in the winter of 1950 to 51. I've been in Korea in the winter. Cold. <laughs> ah, cold. And so poor U.S. Marines and soldiers involved in this very intense fighting uh, against North Koreans and the Chinese. Um, terrible conditions. You see these all these GIs and Marines right here as they're retreating from North Korea. You can see how extraordinarily cold it was. Very, very brutal fighting on both sides as the U.S. begins to retreat. Um, there's all kinds of good books I can recommend to you guys if you guys like military history and survival. Um, Korea is full of both wonderful and terrible stories of that ordeal there. So I recommend it to you guys. But uh, all right. Now, the war actually could go on for two more long, bloody years. So things are really stabilized by the summer of 51, but the war goes on for two more years. But the next two years of war is really a, a stalemate uh, that is pretty much fought along this general central part of the peninsula. And we're not going to really break that down. I say it, it enters more almost like a, a World War I phase of both sides digging trenches, artillery duels, charging trenches, very bloody fighting on both sides as they try to get the advantage for the next two years. But it is largely stalemate. So, okay. Now, by the summer of 51, I think all sides are pretty exhausted. A lot of lives have been lost on all sides. I think all sides are pretty exhausted, and the fighting comes to a stop. But once you guys know this, even though the fighting comes to a stop, the war technically is not ended. And that is unfortunately sadly true even right now. The war is not technically over. Uh, the fighting has stopped. An armistice has been negotiated, but a peace treaty has not been signed. So technically, the war is only paused. And that is, again, contemporary as of right now. There is no peace treaty between North and South Korea. The hostilities have been paused, thank goodness. But the war is not technically over, so official peace has not been declared. And maybe you're wondering, like, why is that? I think it's because, in a very simple kind of way, 
Of course, Koreans realize the country being divided in two is historically not how Korea has been through almost its entire history, outside of the early Three Kingdoms period. Uh, so Koreans, both North and South, recognize Koreans should be together. They should be a unified nation. So this, this current separation to North and South Korea is not what any Korean wants. Well, almost no Korean wants, I should say. Maybe a few in the North Korean government. But the, the, the Korean people do not want this. They realize this is an artificial, painful separation of North Korea and South Korea, and they'd like the Korea to be united, one Korean people. Of course, that is a long-term goal. That's why both sides, till now, have not signed a peace treaty, because, again, a peace treaty, uh, uh, almost in a sad kind of way, would, I guess they would see it, um, would mean they've given up on the idea of reunifying um, and being together. So it's almost like a, a, a divorce, well, not exactly, but you know, that uh, the both parties want to eventually get back together so they don't want to finalize the divorce. And against that's what they're saying. So, okay. Um, these images of the terrible fighting there in Korea, it was quite bloody on all sides, as I mentioned, uh, but we're not going to spend a long time there. I did mention the ideological nature of the warfare. Uh, we'll see that uh, again with the Vietnam War, which we're getting to next. Uh, Ideological wars have an extra element of sadness to them. The reason why is, again, because even within your own side, for example, in this case, South Korea, internally in South Korea, you have quite intense battles between, again, uh, communist South Koreans and anti-communist South Koreans. And, of course, you can't see who is who, right? That means a lot of people are caught in the middle or, or if you're caught in the side that's losing... Um, a lot of civilians are caught up in this and many civilians die in the ideological warfare because, again, they're caught in the middle. And both sides view this struggle as not only fighting external enemy, for example, South Korea, worried about North Korea, but you're also internally, as they would see it, policing your own people. But sadly, that means a lot of violation of human rights, a lot of sadness, it means arrest, accusations, it can mean torture in some cases, executions, massacres, disappearances, and that's on both sides. Why does that matter in the context of the Asian American history? Because you have to be aware of that to realize this is the context in which many Korean families uh, may have come to the United States in the decades after the war, and they're bringing about a certain level of trauma with them. What you're looking at there is an example. This is a South Korean communist uprising in 1948. You guys see the date there, right? 1948. The war didn't start until 1950, summer 1950. So this is actually a couple of years earlier, but that's what I was mentioning is South Korea is already going through a quite difficult time. The Japanese have just been finally, thank God, kicked out. Korea is already traumatized from the Japanese occupation. And now the Japanese are gone. That's like, thank God, we're, we're free but then you get the intense internal struggle of what's Korea's destiny going forward. And you get quite very intense, some quite bloody at times, conflict between uh, the communist view and the anti-communist, more pro-Western, uh, in this case, South Koreans. For example, that photograph there of these young Korean boys, you see one of them wearing a star on his hat right there. That'd be a, a communist symbol. Whether these boys are involved in any kind of uprising or not, we don't really know of them, but just... You, you get an idea of the intensity and tragedy of these very, very young boys. It even looks like a blood in that boy's face. And you wonder what was the fate of these three very, very young men uh, who are caught up in the intense fight on both sides. I mentioned tragically of massacres and disappearances. And these are examples of this. This would be in South Korea. These right here are likely South Koreans who were accused of being pro-communist. Some of them may have been communist or at least sympathetic. And in the the tragedy of the fighting, and sometimes prior to that, you have massacres on both sides. North Korea is doing the same thing. But in North Korea, we, for obvious reasons, we don't have a lot of access to their photographic evidence because North Korea, as you guys know, remains to this day a very cut off, isolated um, nation. So we don't have access to any of that stuff in North Korea. So most examples I've given you are from South Korea because we've had much greater access to the, the, the darkness that took place there. Okay. Told the war on civilization. Yeah, that's what I mentioned. So, uh, just some images there of the fighting. There's some U.S. tanks there in South Korea. 
Okay. Cost of the war. So, how does it impact the United States? 37,000 U.S. soldiers are killed in combat in the Korean War. Um, uh, uh, One million South Korean casualties. We gave you no exact numbers. That means by killed, wounded, and missing. Casualty does not mean killed. That just means profoundly impacted. That could be, includes killed, of course. Also means wounded. Could be missing other things about too. Um, the North Korean numbers would undoubtedly be higher. North Korea, of course, does not publish those numbers, so we don't know. But it would be higher. So the trauma level would be higher in North Korea. Many, many Chinese soldiers, of course, die as well. And we don't have numbers for that. Uh, precisely, but the numbers would be even higher as a cost to this uh, terrible war. I mentioned how civilians oftentimes are caught up in this, again, as part of the trauma of this experience. So uh, the painting you're looking at is depicting a sad event that took place very early on uh, in, the, in the summer 1950, not long after the war started. You had uh, many South Korean civilians, or some of them might be from North Korea, who are rapidly fleeing south, um, trying to escape the advancing North Korean communist forces, and in this painting you see this tradition, make South, uh, South Koreans, some of them maybe North Koreans, trying to rapidly uh, flow south uh, to try to get away from the fighting. But and here's where it gets this tragedy, this kind of fighting. The U.S. got reports there are North Korean soldiers wearing civilian Korean clothing who are intermingling with the Korean refugee columns, South Korean refugee columns. And that said, these columns may or may not actually be civilian. Some of these may be essentially North Korean military units dressed in disguise as South Korean civilians fleeing south. And so an airstrike was called in on what turned out to be a refugee column of South Koreans rapidly trying to, with their family and mothers and fathers and grandfathers and grandmothers and little kids, mothers and young ones, all trying to rapidly escape as refugees flowing south, and an airstrike was called in upon them. The pilots, of course, at that speed and altitude, you can't see very well, right? And they look like civilians, but you are told ahead of time these are probably North Korean soldiers disguised in civilian clothing. Do your job. Again, the war in this time period is very chaotic. The U.S. is losing this point. You got to do an airstrike on this column to slow down their North Korean soldiers. So the planes came in there as called in, and they bomb and strafe this con this a refugee column. Turns out. Perhaps maybe there, that was happening in some places, but in this case, this was a South Korean refugee column. There was not North Koreans, as far as we're aware of, within it. And so you had many South Korean civilians who were killed or badly wounded in this U.S. airstrike. Even the U.S., of course, is the ally of the South Koreans. So the fact that there's an airstrike on the South Korean refugee column, obviously it's part of the fog of war. Um, it's a terrible mistake. But obviously, for South Koreans who lost loved ones in that, it would be a very painful reminder of the complicated nature of the war, the trauma of the war, uh, innocent civilians getting caught up and being killed by both sides. All right, significance of the war. So so why is all this important, of course? And uh, Korea, as you guys know, remains divided. That's currently, as you guys know, in many ways, the Korean War is a proxy war, as you guys know, between uh, the free West, the U.S. above all, and, of course, Russia and China on the side. We'll see this again in Vietnam. You guys have been reading some of that in the Sympathizer, right, of, uh, of these countries in Asia getting caught in these proxy wars between uh, the United States and the Western nations and the Soviet Union, Communist Soviet Union and China on the other hand, and the, these unfortunate battlegrounds taking place in Asia and the profound, terrible effect it has on these Asian host nations that are caught in the crossfire in this ideological battle of the Cold War. After the war, South Korea will go through many difficult years, goes to a certain level of dictatorship, but ultimately has emerged into a democracy today. North Korea goes to one North Korea, I mean, goes from one communist dictatorship to another and remains uh, deeply cut off from the world, as you guys know. North Korea today remains deeply isolated, poor, dictatorial police state. So, now how is that important for the Asian American history class we're talking about? Well, if you see a Korean living in the United States, with very few exceptions, they're not from North Korea. 
And again, there's a few exceptions to this. Now, some of them could be South Koreans who, before the war, they left North Korea and fled south. Now, we do have a, a significant number, again, probably a minority, but we do have some of those who, again, before the war or very early in the war when things are still in chaos, are able to rapidly flee south. So their homeland in Korea would be North Korea, but they immigrated to the United States from South Korea. But with that exception, though, if you meet almost any Korean American, I mean, very, very few, it would be from currently from what would be North Korea following the end of the Korean War, because you guys know they can't leave. So we're talking very, very low numbers. Uh, there are, have been some North Koreans that escaped across the border from North Korea into China, across the Yalu River, and got free to eventually came to the United States. But again, we're looking at tiny numbers. So the vast majority of the Korean American population, of course, not surprisingly, probably into the 99 percentile is from South Korea. South Korea, by the way, has gone from a difficult journey of various governments. We won't go into all that, but uh, some of them were quite dictatorial in the early years, but gradually moving toward more of a democracy, uh, of a freer democracy like they have today. And today they're a technologically advanced, a modern, a progressive democracy. Uh, this is important because, you guys, as you guys know, the Vietnam War is going to come next. And it's not, of course, not just Vietnam, but also Laos and Cambodia be profoundly impact what takes place in the Vietnam War. And that's coming with our next lecture. But Korea sets the groundwork for a more direct, intense U.S. involvement with an Asian nation involving a war and then a, an ongoing U.S. relationship with that. Um, now, South Korea remains unique in, unique in some ways in that uh, South Korea does not lose their war, right? And uh, so South Korea remains allied in the United States too. Of course, that's not going to be the case with Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. But of course, there's still continued tension in Asia today between North Korea and South Korea and the larger world, as you guys know. This is the first war in which, uh, following World War II, the U.S. is involved in distant conflict that Perhaps, at least on the surface, not directly threaten the United States in the short run, but America feels like for ideological reasons, we must participate in this. This will be also, as you guys lead up into what place, takes place uh, with the Vietnam War over, again, fears of expansion of communism. And this one, I'm not sure why that, oh, I don't want to change there, but okay. Let me fix that. There we go. Now. Even more specific in context of our class, and again, guess me to write this one down. Due to America's involvement in, apparently I like that phrase more than once. <laughs> okay, there we go. Uh, due to America's involvement in the Korean War, immigration of Koreans to the United States dramatically increases. Uh, there was a Korean population, of course, as I mentioned, the Stars Lecture in the United States prior to the Korean War, but it was relatively small. But the, the intense U.S. involvement with Korea, both in the war and following the war down to today, means there's been a, a major increase in the Korean population arriving here in the United States. Uh, some coming as war brides, some in, come, coming in contact because of uh, contact with the United States as a close allied nation. It could, it could, be, it could be the romantic connections, could be for business, could be for students. Uh, for business, etc. And then also you have a significant number of Koreans who come to the United States looking for a new start. Uh, Korea after the Korean War was devastated. The country was very poor in those early years after the war. Poor, life is difficult, the opportunities in many cases are quite limited, life is very hard. And so you can see if you were a Korean family and you had the ability to come to the United States, uh, for many Korean families it seems like despite the the sadness, of course, of leaving the homeland, but looking for your kids and for a stable, prosperous future, the United States might be uh, your choice for a significant number of, uh, of Koreans. And that, of course, means the Korean population in the United States is going to grow uh, dramatically following the war, uh, much more so than it had been prior to the war. That's the Korean War Memorial there in Washington, D.C. If you guys ever Washington, D.C., along with the Vietnam Memorial, which is outstanding. The Korean War was also very moving. I highly recommend go checking it out, both for the, the service of American uh, veterans of that war of all uh, backgrounds and also for our ongoing relationship with South Korea. And, of course, above all, with our Korean American brothers and sisters, too, who uh, 
uh, this war has profoundly impacted uh, other lives in many, many ways. North Korea and South Korea remains divided, as you guys know. Uh, that's a, a, the, the only place in North Korea and South Korea that currently have contact with each other, which would be a very small uh, compound called Panmunjom. Um, and you can see the dividing line between North and the South Korea, and that dividing line is right there. So what you're looking at here in the foreground, these are South Korean soldiers right here. Um, and here in the background, that is North Korea. Um, but this is the only place in the whole Korean Peninsula you actually have like close contact between South Korea and North Korea. The rest of, uh, of the Korean Peninsula, both South and North, you have the DMZ dividing the two peninsulas. DMZ is quite wide. So it's not like, say, like a Berlin Wall where you can just like look across. That's not the case. The DMZ is miles wide, miles wide. And so you don't have any direct, you can't wave. There's just, yeah, you're miles and miles away from, even when you're on the border, I've been there, when you're on the border between South Korea and North Korea, you're actually not even close to North Korea, not really. Now, I suppose the bird flies, you're just, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight miles away. But reality is even farther than that. North Korea, as I mentioned, has, has remained a, a very sad dictatorial state with a cult of personality. It's a very Orwellian kind of place um, uh, where the North Korean people, of course, have no civil rights, no civil liberties, no freedom of speech, no freedom of religion. Um, they live in what I call a cult of personality under the North Korean uh, dictators. Uh, their whole lives are geared into a, a really a cult following of the leader of North Korea. Initially, of course, that'd be Kim Il-sung. That's a poor, uh, post of him much later in life. By the way, the book that they're all holding there, of course, is Surprise, written by this guy. Eventually, his son will take over. That's uh, Kim Jong-il. And then, as you guys know, he passed away not too many years ago, and his son has taken over uh, Kim Jong-un. That's his son right there. Uh, this is from a number of years ago already, but uh, you can see kind of the, the just insanity, the cold of personality. These are some young uh, North Korean soldiers, and the, he's arrived to encourage them, and they're crying with happiness like he's some rock star. But, of course, that is the case, right? Because uh, in North Korean propaganda, he is the embodiment, almost like a living god, essentially, of the North Korean people. I'm not sure why I put a Team America uh, puppet in there, but <laughs> it's not. if you're familiar with that movie, that's not all wrong of uh, just the maniacal nature of the North Korean regime. Tragically, not, not funny at all, but the reality is North Korea is probably has perhaps the worst human rights record in the world at is saying something. Um, but prison camps, execution, families being exiled, uh, parents being executed, um, Thought control, absolute control of the media, zero civil liberties of any kind, uh, lack of food, lack of proper medical care, lack of knowledge of the outside world, living in an isolated uh, police state of a George Orwellian um, context. Uh, I won't go through all this, but South Korea, of course, is doing a much, much better um, I have worked in South Korea a number of years, as you guys know from me mentioning that in earlier lectures, and I was teaching English and Bible there when I was in college. I was your guys' age. I, was, I took a, a year off, went to South Korea and lived there. Um, I had a great time. If you guys get a chance to travel internationally as uh, students, um, I highly encourage you guys to do it. I was there for one year initially. Loved it. Now, of course, I missed home. When I was there back in 1991, there was not a lot of... Uh, there was not a Taco Bell on every block, I'll just put it that way. <laughs> uh, I, I grew to love Korean food, and I love Korean food. But uh, back in that time period, there was not many other options beyond that one. And by the way, I love Korean food, so I, it wasn't, I didn't like Korean food. Um, I love it. But uh, I did miss uh, pasta. I miss Mexican food. <laughs> I had this other kinds of food that I just in that time period didn't have access to. Now, Korea, by the way, just since I was there back in 1991, Korea has grown dramatically since then. So actually, if you go there now, you can get some of those things. It's changed dramatically. Back in that time period, I remember I was in uh, South Korea for, let me think now, six months. Didn't once have a chance to have any Mexican food. I was craving it. I found out there was one 
Taco Bell in Seoul. But I'm not saying Taco Bell is classic Mexican food. We all know. Okay, it's not. Right? It's, a, it's American fast food. Okay, we get, we get it. With the Mexican flavor, I guess. But in any case, when you got nothing, when I got on Taco Bell, I almost like shed tears of happiness. <laughs> uh, but again, that was that was back in 1990. It's changed dramatically today. Um, South Korea is growing increasingly cosmopolitan, increasingly international in parts of it. Um, big cities, that's the subway map there in Seoul. It's a mass city population of more than 10 million live in the metropolitan area of Seoul. And if you include surrounding suburbs and satellite cities, probably the greater population of the entire Seoul region is probably pushing around 20 million. Maybe not quite there, but it's probably not too far off. So there's a massive urban complex. Uh, like any massive city, things are happening there 24 hours. Um, then again, that's my personal connection. I showed you guys some photographs at the start of the semester there, but that is my father-in-law, my mother-in-law, my wife, and my kids. Although this picture is already quite dated. My daughter now is 18. And my son is 15. So definitely my wife could not be holding my son right now. I, mean, I think he could hold her. <laughs> so that photograph is already getting quite dated there. But uh, as are these. We're showing you some fantastic Korean food. This is my niece right here at the end. She's Boy, she must be 14 now, maybe 15. Um, so obviously, uh, this is many years gone by. That's her holding on to my baseball cap right there as I'm carrying her on my shoulders. Um, that's my wife right there sitting there with our sister-in-law, having a fantastic cream meal. Um, yeah, look at all the side dishes there. Delicious. <laughs> that's one wonderful thing about, uh, again, Asia, as you guys know, is very diverse, but... Uh, it's not that unusual for uh, Asian cuisines to have a very different style than we have here, which is to have many, many individual side dishes. So when you're having a meal, you might have some, actually this meal we're having in front of you, that, that isn't, there's no like one thing you're eating a lot of. You're eating a lot of something. Now you have some soup in front of you that's for you, but you're also sharing a ton of those side dishes. Each one of those has a different flavor. Some are spicy, some are salty, some are a little bit sweet. Um, makes my mouth water looking at them. It's fantastic. There's no, and the look right there. That looks like halfway through the meal because some of those dishes are getting kind of empty. But uh, yeah, that's some good eating. <laughs> uh, again, these are a little bit dated. This is going to a, a, a water park there with my brother-in-law, my niece and nephew. And that's my daughter there. Again, she's 18. I could no longer hold her like that anymore, in case you're wondering. I don't know if she could pick me up, probably not, but uh, yeah, time has changed there. But uh, that was having, having a great day with my uh, my Korean family there. South Korea, as you guys know, has been making a major cultural global uh, global impact in recent years. Uh, this is already kind of dated there, but Gangnam Style and the Psy and, the, and then more recently, BTS, which my wife and daughter are big fans. My son and I, not so much. I'm not against them. I think they're a very talented young man, but that's just not, I think that's more of a ladies thing. But they are talented. I will give them that. Um, and that's Blackpink. Maybe some of you guys know that group there on the right. There's many of the Korean groups, of course, too. That's just a small sampling. Maybe some of you guys saw the movie Parasite, which won Best Picture back in 2019. Powerful. If you haven't seen that, I recommend it to you guys, although it's not an easy movie to watch. Those of you guys who are watching, you guys know that. It's brilliant, it's powerful, it's riveting. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> it's also intense. So just FYI, if you would, would like to watch that, again, I recommend it to you guys. It's powerful. But uh, all kinds of Korean dramas crash landing into you. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Korean dramas on Netflix and Amazon, but. Uh, Again, if you're interested in Asian American history, again, these are focused on Korea. But again, but, but the context understanding uh, the Asian American community, again, uh, it's very helpful to understand what's going on in Asia because that has spillover on who the Asian American community is. Now, again, some Asian Americans are born inside the United States. Some Korean Americans are born here. So their contact with South Korea varies greatly depending on individual individuals, you guys know, right? But still, this is uh, oftentimes an important cultural background that influences how they perceive themselves even in the United States as a Korean American. So uh, if you guys like some good TV series, Crash Landing Into You would be a fun one. My wife loved that one. I've not watched that one myself, but she sure did. Um, Mr. Sunshine uh, is great. That's a, a period drama. Uh, 
And then uh, if you guys like um, Police Detective and uh, Thrillers, uh, Stranger, which came out in 2017, I believe that's on Netflix, is great. My wife and I watched that about a year ago. Loved it. Um, but there's many more, so I just mentioned a couple. There's a lot of great stuff on, on Amazon, Netflix, etc. So if you guys want to uh, check out some Korean dramas, I highly recommend it to them. Uh, by the way, I'm just limited. I'm talking any of these, right? You don't have to be limited to Korean dramas. There's lots of wonderful stuff from Asia. Just uh, since this is the context of the Korean War, I'm talking about the Korean community, and I have a stake in that one too. But, <laughs> but you know, there's all kinds of Japanese dramas and Thai and Chinese, you name it. So, uh, some good Korean food there. If you guys like spicy stuff, I imagine some of you guys do. I recommend some hot ramen there on the left. Oh, that's too hot for me. That's not my cup of tea. But some of you guys, it may be. You've never tried uh, that bulldog ramen. Give it a shot. Um, if you've not tried Korean barbecue before, you got to try it. Now, unfortunately, uh, we do not have a good Korean barbecue place locally. It's not fair. It's not right. <laughs> but we don't have one of you guys can open one up. So locally, you need to get in your car and you have to drive. San Jose has some good places. There's some very good places in Sacramento. They're, um, Stockton has a pretty good uh, Korean restaurant. Maybe some others around too. Uh, but although Sacramento and the Bay Area are probably your best bet. But if you never tried Korean barbecue, highly recommend it. It's a very fun and enjoyable experience. Uh, as you see in these photographs right here, uh, typically you sit at the table and they'll have the the barbecue, you actually will barbecue the meat yourself. They bring it to you. It's not been cooked. It's been marinated, but they bring it to you raw. You put it on to the burner, and you cook it to your satisfaction. So if you like your barbecue well done, then you well done it. I don't know if that's a word, but you know what I mean. If you want it rare, then that's up to you. You take it off when you're ready to eat it. So, But you cook it right there at your table to your personal satisfaction. You get a piece of leaf, uh, you get one of these leaves right here, you put some rice in there, you put the beef in your joint, just like beef, chicken, whatever uh, you decide to barbecue. I put uh, maybe a jalapeno on there, put some garlic on there, put a little hot sauce on there. You put that thing in a ball and you stuff it in right here. Super good. You got to try it. If, you're not, if you guys like barbecue, if I cream barbecue, get out there and try it. So. All right, I think that's the end of this lecture. I will come back to the impact of all of this, but uh, again, this this background of the war is going to profoundly impact uh, the Asian American experience as more and more Koreans begin to come to the United States, and then Korea's ongoing story uh, and its impact on America. In this case, recent cultural impact is ongoing and playing a major role in America right now. And you can see that ongoing impact both for the Asian American community, but also just the broader American community. Um, if you were to ask me when I was in college back, say, in 1988, what I knew about Korea in 1988, it wouldn't be this, but it would not be a lot. Uh, if you ask me about Korean cultural imports to the United States, I would have been able, not been able to tell you anything. No Korean dramas, no Korean music, no where's the Korean food, Korean culture, nothing. There's nothing. It wasn't, I wasn't interested, just it wasn't part of my orbit. I didn't see it anywhere. It's not on social media, not on TV. I don't see that really anywhere. No, of course there were Korean Americans back in 1990. Of course there were. You know, when I got to college, my college is very diverse, and I met a significant number of Korean Americans in college. So that was kind of my first introduction to the Korean American community. But as part of just the mainstream American community, that was kind of my introduction. Now, again, I did have some Korean American classmates when I was in elementary school, but I didn't know much about them. I knew they were Korean, but that's about all I knew. And you can see how dramatically how that's changing as the Asian American community continues to make an increasing cultural impact in America, and increasingly so as America becomes more and more pluralistic in a wide range of cultural influences. Uh, in this case, in the context of our class, profoundly influenced by the Asian American community living here with us as our brothers and sisters, in this case, as my wife <laughs> uh, and my in-laws and so. All right, we better stop right there. So you guys, uh, good to see you guys, and we'll see you with the next lecture. So take care, everybody. Bye-bye.